Well, we're continuing our series, um, and we're talking about the miracles of Jesus. And, uh, you know, who knows that miracles aren't just for 2,000 years ago. You know, the, the, the miracles of Jesus, you know, are, are, are to inspire us today. And, you know, God still does miracles. But Thomas is going to come and preach to us now, and he's talking about the next miracle of Jesus as we start to move towards the greatest miracle of all, which is in two weeks' time, which is Easter Sunday, the resurrection. Are you looking forward to that? Yes. Yeah? You're looking forward to that. But it's great to have Thomas now, and he's going to come and continue our series and speaking on the miracles of Jesus. Let's give Thomas a warm welcome as he comes to speak this morning. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Thomas. I'd like to start, if I could, with the Bible reading, which is John chapter 6. Verses 1 to 15. And if you watch the screen, you can see the words. After this, Jesus crossed to the former shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then, Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. Jewish Passover festival was near, and when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take almost a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. Well, how far will they go among so many? And Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down about 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the rock, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over, that nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. So that is John's version of the account of Jesus feeding the 5,000. So today, my title is Miracles of Jesus Feeding the 5,000, but I have a subtitle, which is This is Who I Am. Now, I'm not talking about me. I'm not going to be talking about who I am today. I'm Thomas Halley, for those of you who haven't uh, seen me or heard me before, and I'm one of the people on the leadership team at Sawyer's Church. But when I say the subtitle is This is Who I Am, there are, what's the word? Speech marks there. This is a quote. I'm putting words in Jesus' mouth, if you like. How could I dare to do that? I'm saying that... The reason why Jesus fed 5,000 people was because he wanted to tell people, this is who I am. The reason Jesus fed the people was to show his identity. So, as we look through today, I'm going to start off with looking at who Jesus is like. And I'm going to look at a couple of characters from the Old Testament. Jesus is a bit like Moses. Why do I say that? Well, when we look at the feeding of the 5,000, there's a parallel with Moses being there when God provided bread from heaven to the people of Israel, the Hebrews. You can read about it in Exodus chapter 16. And... It's a miraculous supply of food. It was called manna, which means, what is it? So this strange substance appeared on the ground every day for nearly 40 years. There was always enough for that day, but they couldn't hoard it and keep it till the next day. 
just enough for their needs. God supplying for their needs. And in the same way, Jesus supplied the needs of the people, the 5,000 men and the people, and probably maybe up to 10,000 people there if you count women and children. But Jesus supplied their needs, just like Moses was there with the bread from heaven. And something else which is quite interesting, this happened in a secluded place. Now, if you look in another passage in the New Testament, in fact, two passages, Matthew 14 and Luke. So Matthew 14 and Mark 6, it says that Jesus went to a solitary place or a secluded place. Now, the word that's used there in the Greek language is actually the same word for wilderness. So that's another reminder that Jesus was, just as Jesus was in a secluded place, the people who received the bread from heaven were also in a secluded place. And there's more parallels. Mountain. Jesus was on a mountainside when he fed the 5,000. And Moses went up a mountain to receive the Ten Commandments from God. And also there's a parallel in the numbers. Okay? Numbers are very important to Jewish people. And what are the numbers in the food? There's five loaves and two fish. What does the number five mean to Jewish people? When they're thinking about Moses, they'll think instantly. There's five books of Moses, five books which Moses wrote. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. At the first five books of our Bible, that would be in the mind of people when they hear about the five loaves. And the two fish, what's the two? There were two stone tablets that Moses received the law of God on. These numbers... I don't believe us coincidences. They are significant to show the parallels between Moses and Jesus. And there's more. The number 12. This one is even more important. There were 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus deliberately chose 12 men to be his apostles, the ones that he sent out, 12 disciples. And how many baskets were left over after the 5,000 were fed. There were 12 baskets left over. 12 is the number of the Jewish people. So this is a statement that Jesus is making. I will provide for the Jewish people. I've got enough to provide for these people, the 12 tribes of Israel, the people of Israel. So, let's move on. Jesus is, in a way, like Moses. But he's also like another person from the Old Testament, Elijah. Now, think back to the story of Elijah. Maybe a less familiar story, but Elijah was involved with miracles of multiplication of food. He was fed by ravens during a famine. Now, I'm not an expert on birds. I don't know much about ravens, but I've been, led to, I've been told that ravens do not normally feed human beings. <laughs> <laughs> Quite the opposite. <laughs> so this was a miracle that God used ravens to provide for a man, Elijah, during a time of famine and drought. And then immediately afterwards, Elijah went to somebody's house. He went to the house of a widow. And this widow had almost given up hope of living. All she had was a tiny bit of flour and a tiny bit of oil. But all the time that Elijah stayed in her house, God provided miraculously. The oil never ran out. The flour never ran out. Food was multiplied. So the same God who multiplied food for Elijah is the same God who enabled Jesus to multiply the bread and the fish. Yeah. So Jesus is like Moses and like Elijah. But there's more. It's not enough to say he's like Moses and Elijah. He's actually greater yeah. than Moses and greater than Elijah because Jesus is looking for participants. Let's have a look at another incident from the story of Moses. Now, Moses brought the people of Israel out of Egypt. 
And after he got out of Egypt, he was in the wilderness, and he met up with his father-in-law, a man called Jethro. And Jethro said to him, look, Moses, you're going to wear yourself out. It's just one of you, and you're acting as the judge for all these people. There could have been one, maybe two million people there in the desert. And they were coming to Moses with their problems. And Moses was having to deal with all their problems. Jethro said, no, don't do this. Appoint other people to be judges. You've got to delegate. So Moses did that. And when he was delegating, he organized these new people to be judges and said, okay, you be in charge of different groups, thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. And there is a parallel there with what Jesus did with his disciples. Jesus got his disciples, and you can read about it in Mark chapter 6. He told them to make the people sit down in groups of a hundreds and fifties. Can you see the parallel? Yes. Just as Moses didn't want to delegate and had to be told by his father-in-law, Jesus goes a step further. Jesus delegated. He was strategic in planning. He organized his disciples. He wanted them to be participants. And I've never seen this before, but actually there's a very similar parallel with Elijah. Now, Elijah had seen amazing miracles from God. But when Jezebel, the wife of King Ahab, when Jezebel threatened his life, he almost gave up his life. He was depressed. And he was depressed because he thought he was alone. The only, he thought he was the only one still worshipping God. He didn't think about delegating. God had to speak to him. And God spoke to him in a still, small voice. And God told him to anoint Elisha as the next prophet to succeed him. Anointing is a symbolic action of pouring oil on somebody's head to show they're chosen for a special task. So Elijah anointed Elisha, and also he anointed or was told to anoint two kings to help in the work of fighting against Jezebel, who was leading people to worship Baal and other gods. So, whereas Elijah didn't see the need to delegate, Jesus did delegate. He used his disciples. He entrusted his disciples as participants in spreading the message and helping. Did you know, when the bread and the fish multiplied, it wasn't in Jesus' hands, it was in the hands of the disciples. Yeah, yeah. And this is a challenge for us. Jesus is greater than Moses. He's greater than Elijah. He is greater than Moses. Now, Moses is a symbol of the law, and Jesus is more important than the law of God. The law of God came to Moses on tablets of stone. But Jesus sends his Holy Spirit yeah. that fills us with power to yeah. keep the commandments. Yeah. So we can do it by God's power. And Jesus is greater than Elijah. Elijah was a, one of the greatest prophets. And the prophets in the Old Testament were sent mainly for the people of Israel. With a few exceptions. And Elijah did meet this widow that we talked about earlier when she was fed with the bread and oil. She actually wasn't from Israel. She was from one of the neighbours. But apart from a few exceptions, all the prophets came for the people of Israel. But Jesus came with a message of good news for the people of Israel and the yes. people of every nation. Yeah. So Jesus yes. is greater than those. He's greater than Elijah, greater than the law, greater than the prophets. He's looking for participants. And this is where I'd like to challenge us this morning. Are we ready to participate? And there's a kind of irony here because I'm standing in front of you and you're all sitting and listening. And I'm so glad that you came this morning. Thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching, those who are watching online. But let's be honest. The aim of being a Christian is not to spend our life passively sitting on chairs listening to someone. 
There's so much more for us. Yeah. That is not what Jesus wanted for his disciples. He didn't want them to spend their whole life passively sitting and listening to him. They only listened to him for three years, and then he was he died, he rose again, and he ascended to heaven. And then it was down to the disciples to be participating in spreading yeah. the message to the nations of the world. So we have a challenge. We are not to be passive people, just sitting while Peter or me or other people stand at the front and we just listen. No, a whole week is an opportunity for us to be sharing the good news yeah. of Jesus yeah. with our friends, our family, our colleagues, whoever we meet. So, we are called to be participants. <laughs> called to be participants. Let's move on. Another part of Jesus' identity is he is compassionate. God is a God of compassion, and Jesus is compassionate. That's who he is. Now, did you know that the feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle of Jesus to be recorded in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? And here's a few words from the introductions to the miracle in Mark and Matthew. First of all, Matthew, chapter 14. It says, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed those who were ill. And then in Mark, chapter 6, it says, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. So Jesus' compassion led him to heal people, to meet their physical and emotional needs. His compassion also led, them, led him to teach them to meet their spiritual needs and also emotional needs. And in this, on this occasion, his compassion led him to feed people who were physically hungry. They'd been listening to him for a long time, so, and there was no food there. They needed food. But the physical feeding is symbolic of the spiritual feeding that Jesus feeds us. Jesus feeds us with spiritual life. And all of this flows from his compassion. This reminds me of um, the role of nursing. Now, my wife, Nadia, has been working as a nurse for the past 20 years. And although I'm not a nurse... Um, I couldn't be a nurse, I don't think. Um, I've learned so much from listening to Nadia about what nursing is, what nursing is, and the model of nursing. Now, let me give you an example. Imagine you went to have an appointment with a nurse, and you said, um, "This part of my body's hurting." Imagine the nurse said, "Okay, here's a tablet. Go. Stop moaning. Stop whinging. Look, you got your tablet. Your pain. Take the tablet. The pain will go, and that's it." That's not nursing, because nursing is about meeting physical, practical, emotional, social, and spiritual needs. Because we are whole people. Yeah. And in the same way that nursing is about meeting all these different needs, in the same way Jesus meets people's needs on so many different levels. Good. Jesus Good. didn't Good. just heal the sick and say, right, you're okay now, get lost. No, of course not. He cared about their physical needs, their emotional needs, their social needs, their practical yeah. needs, and yeah. their spiritual needs. And this is a challenge for us. Yes, Jesus is compassionate. Are we compassionate? Now, I know people in this room are compassionate, and people listening online. I know that many of you have given money to help support refugees from the war in Ukraine, and that's fantastic. But the challenge to us, the challenge to me, is don't just do a money transfer and say, oh yeah, I've helped the people in Ukraine. No, let's pray yeah. for their spiritual yeah. needs. Yeah. The people who are away from their homes and families, separated from their husbands, <laughs> people who 
don't know what's going to happen because their home has been destroyed. There's so many social, emotional and spiritual needs that also need to be met. Let's have an attitude where we can have compassion on people on all of their needs. That's just yeah. one example. Yeah. When we show compassion, yeah. let's not neglect people's emotional needs. Let's not neglect their practical needs. Let's not neglect their spiritual needs. And the next part of Jesus' identity is that Jesus is the Son of God. Yeah. This is clear from the way he's able to multiply bread. I don't know human beings who can do that. That's the power of God. Yes, yeah. And I'm like, I'd like to mention a passage which has already been mentioned in this series by both John Morris and Samson when they were giving earlier messages about miracles of Jesus. This comes from the, near the end of John's Gospel, John chapter 20, verse 30 to 31. It says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And... That by believing, you may have life in his name. That's the reason why John included these miracles and not all of the miracles, because Jesus did many more. He selected them because of his purpose in writing. He wanted people to believe in Jesus and have life. To believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that means a chosen one. The one that had been promised through the Old Testament. The one who was chosen to represent God. The Son of God. And by believing, we can have life. That's eternal life, which begins right now, but doesn't end even when our physical bodies are no longer here. That's why Jesus healed the sick. That's why he fed the 5,000, because he wanted people to believe who he was. Jesus says, this is who I am. I'm greater than Moses. I'm greater than Elijah. I'm looking for partitioner. I'm looking for participants. I'm compassionate. I am the Son of God, yeah. Jesus says. And there may be some people listening today who've been brought up to believe that Jesus is not the Son of God. Some people have been brought up to believe that it's impossible for God to have a son. And whether you're here today or listening on the internet, I want to encourage you. Because I know it's hard when you're told from an early age something. And people who love you and care about you, people that you trust, have told you this isn't true. And then you hear Jesus is the son of God. You think, well, can't be, because that's not what I've been taught. I want to encourage you to look at the evidence. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John all wrote about Jesus feeding the 5,000. Yeah. And two of those people, Matthew and John, were eyewitnesses. Not just eyewitnesses, they were there. It was in their hands that yeah. this food was being given out. And they looked back in the basket and there was more to give. This is good historical evidence. Yeah. Not just one person writing. Four people wrote about it. And Mark and Luke, who weren't there at the time probably, they interviewed people who yeah. were there. So that is a challenge for us. Are we going to believe people who taught us things when we were young? Or are we going to believe Jesus and the eyewitnesses who wrote about Jesus? I'm going to take a slightly different direction now and look at the question, how did people respond when they saw the feeding of the 5,000? How did they respond when they thought about who Jesus was? Now, I don't have time to go into all of this today, but I encourage you, if you have time this week, have a look at John chapter 6. The whole chapter is not just about the miracle of the feeding the 5,000, it's also about the miracle of walking on water. And I just, got, I just made a mistake. I said that Samson spoke <laughs> previously. It, wasn't, it was Dean. Sorry, Dean. Sorry, Samson. <laughs> you got Samson next week, by the way, talking about Jesus walking on water. And where was I? 
how do people respond? Yes, you can read about it because not only is it about the miracles, the second part of John chapter 6 is all about Jesus' teaching, saying who he is, and the discussions with people who have been listening to what he said. And we heard the first bit in our reading this morning. Verse 15, some of the people intended to come and make Jesus king by force. They thought that Jesus was going to be a political hero who would beat the Romans who'd been occupying their land. But Jesus said, no, that's not who I am. He went up and withdrew himself from them. Then some more people, later on in John 6, verse 26, there were some people that were looking for Jesus because they ate the loaves and had their fill. In other words, they were looking for another free lunch. <laughs> and Jesus said no. Then in verse 30, some still more people came and asked for another sign. It's like they'd seen one miracle already, but that wasn't enough. Imagine you see the, Jesus feed 5,000 people. You think, oh, can you do another sign? I'm not really sure if, that, if you are the son of God. Just do another sign for me. But Jesus doesn't do miracles on demand. That's a serious point. We can't go to Jesus and say, oh, Jesus, you've got to do this miracle for me, or else I won't believe in you. Look what he's already done. Jesus doesn't do miracles on demand. And then this is probably, or possibly, one of the saddest verses in the New Testament. John chapter 6, verse 66. Many of them, and that's people who have been described as disciples, followers of Jesus, many of them turned back and no longer followed Jesus. Even after the miracle, the people still didn't get it. Even after the miracle of feeding the 5,000, some of them believed, but many still didn't get it. What about us? When we hear the miracle of Jesus feeding the 5,000, do we focus on the physical or do we sometimes miss the spiritual? When we hear about this miracle, do we focus on the gift, the food, but not on the giver, the God who is amazing, who is able to provide in this way? There's an application which is relevant for us here in Brentwood at Sawyer's Church. We're so grateful to be in a position where we're able to build a building at the end of this road, Sawyer's Hall Lane. We're so grateful that people have given us money. Many of the people are in this room. Many of these people, many of the people who have been in this church have moved on, but they've given generously. There are many people from other churches who've given generously to this project, and there's people from outside the church who's given. I'm grateful to all these people who've given, but we can't just stop there and think, oh, well, that's it, we've got it. We've got the money, let's go and build the church and forget about God. No, God is the one who's the giver. God is the one who enabled people and move their hearts in order to give. And it's God who provides for us. We mustn't just focus on the physical thing. Oh yes, we've got a building, that's fine. We can have more people come in, sit and participate, sit and just absorb. And then, oh yes, we're a nice big church. No, there's so much more. God wants us to be participants and God wants us to focus on him, yeah. the giver, yeah. and not just on the gifts yeah. that we get. Of course, we're grateful for all the gifts we get, but we're more, more importantly, we need to be grateful to God who provides us with more than we could ever need. And this principle of focusing on the gift or focusing on the giver, this is a challenge for all of us. Let's think of our prayer life. What do we pray for? What do you pray for? What do I pray for? Are the first things I pray for physical things? Oh, I need to be healed. I need, I need money. I need help for my family. I need my children to do well at school. Are these the first things that I pray for? Are these the only things I pray for? Or do I also pray for spiritual needs? Of course, we say thank you to God when he does give us what we need. And when we get a new job, when we get a 
Um, when we experience healing or recovery from an illness, of course we thank God. But let's also look for the spiritual. And when I pray, is my prayer life just about me and my needs? Or is my prayer life saying to God, God, let your will be done. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, use me. Yes, you've blessed me with something, but how can I use that to bless others? You've given me a job. How can you enable me to serve you in this job? Let's not just focus on the gift. Let's focus on the giver. So, we've seen Jesus has said who he is through this miracle. And we've seen that he's greater than Moses, greater than Elijah. Jesus is looking for participants. Jesus is compassionate. And Jesus is the Son of God. But I've missed out another aspect of Jesus' identity, which is relevant to this particular miracle. And that is, Jesus is the bread of life. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. The second half of the chapter 6 in John's Gospel, it's all about the discussion where Jesus is explaining that he is the bread of life. Before we look at what that means, we're going to draw out the fact that in the Gospel of John, there's seven signs before the resurrection of Jesus. In other words, seven miracles. And there's also seven I am statements where Jesus says, I am, and then explains something about his character. And in three of these cases, the sign is actually linked to the statement. There's a link between the miracle and the message. And this is the first one. The first statement where Jesus says, I am, is I am the bread of life. And that is very closely linked with the miracle of feeding the 5,000. Feeding the 5,000 illustrates the message that Jesus is the bread of life. And when Jesus heals a man who's been born blind, that illustrates Jesus' teaching that he is the light of the world. And then when Lazarus is raised from the dead... That illustrates Jesus' teaching that he is the resurrection and the life. The sign illustrates the statement. The miracle illustrates the message. So what does it mean when Jesus says, I am the bread of life? Bread is a staple food in the Middle East. You can't live without bread in the Middle East. That's the most important food. So Jesus is saying, in the same way that bread is essential for physical life, I am essential for spiritual life. Jesus is essential for life. We can't live without him. He's all that we need. If we try living without him or without believing in him, that's not enough. Now, this actually illustrates... The same point is illustrated in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. We're told there the reason why God gave the people of Israel the bread from heaven. The reason was so that they would understand that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's showing us that spiritual food is more important than physical food. And that's the same point that Jesus is making. And, and in actual fact, when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, he is identifying himself as God. In fact, all the I am statements, Jesus is identifying himself as God because the words I am, actually in the Hebrew language, mean the name of God. Again, we're going to go back to Moses. When Moses had heard God speaking out of a burning bush, he had a conversation with God in Exodus 3. And this is how part of that conversation went. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what's his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am 
who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So the very words, I am, when they come out of the mouth of Jesus, people listening to him know this man is saying that he is God. I am is the name of God. So, this is who Jesus is. This is who I am, says Jesus. I am greater than Moses. I'm greater than Elijah because I am looking for participants. I'm compassionate. I am the Son of God, says Jesus. And he says, I am the bread of life. We're going to move now into a time of sharing communion. And the song which is leading us into communion is an appropriate song. Passover. Now, what's that got to do with today's talk? I don't know if you noticed in John chapter 6, verse 4, it just threw in a little detail that the festival of Passover was there. Why was that there? Actually, it's there for a reason, because... That's a very, very important festival for Jewish people. That's their freedom festival. It's their celebration of independence, remembering the time when they were released from slavery in Egypt. And on the night that that happened, God gave some specific instructions to them. They would have to have a meal before they left. And the, the lamb that they were going to eat in this meal had to be killed. And the blood, they were told to put the blood on the doorposts, on the frames of the door. That blood was a sign for the angel of God to pass over their houses. It was only on the doors of the Israelite houses. The other houses in Egypt contained the Egyptian people. These were the people who'd refused to let the people of Israel go. On those houses, the angel of God killed every firstborn son. Quite a horrendous plague. But the people of Israel were delivered. They were safe. They were unharmed because the blood was on the door frames. Now, they ate the Passover. And then on the night when Jesus died, the night before Jesus died, what did Jesus do? He ate the Passover meal with his followers. And the Passover meal was remembering their freedom, remembering deliverance from slavery. But what did Jesus do? He said, you know this Passover meal? It's about me. It's about me. I don't know whether they understood it at the time. But this is what was going on. Jesus was saying... I am the Passover lamb. The words on the screen were written by Paul a few years later. He said, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Can you see the blood on the doorposts has a parallel with the blood on the cross. Jesus' blood on the beams of wood going vertically and horizontally. Jesus' blood is there as a sign pulling together all that God had been preparing through the history of the Old Testament right up until the time of Jesus. When we put our faith in Jesus and say, I believe you are the bread of life. I believe you died on the cross for me. Then God, when he looks at us, just as the angel passed over the people of Israel. God passes over us. He doesn't judge us. He doesn't condemn us. Even though we've rebelled against him, we've been disobedient, we've sinned. God looks at the blood on the cross. God looks at the blood and says, this one's mine. This person believes in Jesus. This person is forgiven, not because he or she deserves it, but because Jesus has taken that punishment instead. And that is why 
we share bread and wine. It's a reminder of Jesus' death for us. I want to encourage anyone listening today who maybe has been in church for a while but never shared communion. I want to encourage you, if you believe that Jesus died for you, take the bread and the wine or the juice and eat it and drink it to remember that Jesus died and be thankful for that. If you're not sure what you believe, if you're not sure that Jesus is the Son of God, if you're not sure what all this means about Jesus dying for you, that's okay, pass. You don't have to take the bread and wine. I know that we're not passing them around. They've already been um, passed around to you for COVID reasons, of course. We, we do it this way now. So whether or not you eat or drink, you're welcome here. But if you choose to eat and drink, remember that it's because Jesus died for us. And let's sing this song. And the first line of this song is about the bread of life. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. I take the bread of life.